The man dug a grave in the middle of the night and after half an hour he finally saw the body. The stench is overwhelming. Upon examination he found a stab wound in the body's neck. While examining, a zombie suddenly appeared behind him. By the time John noticed, the zombie had fallen into the pit. But John used Cameron's body to block it. Another zombie joined the attack. But John, using all his strength, smashed its head with a shovel and brutally killed the second one. In Cameron's hand, John found weapon fragments, likely from his resistance. Now, by checking for a damaged weapon and its records, John could identify the murderer. The next day, John sought Victor's help. Given their past interaction in Victor's high rank, when he came to the grave, John did not expect after last night's fight Cameron's neck has been blurred almost cannot be seen. They had to use Victor's authority to access the weapon registry. After a long search, John noticed a missing knife. Matching the knife's description to the fragments he found, they seemed identical, but the records for that day were torn, indicating a cover-up. John updated Janice on his investigation, promising to save her. Janice, realizing John couldn't change the situation, urged him to stop his inquiry. Virginia entered just then, Victor claimed they were witnesses to Janice's confession. Janice, not wanting to implicate John, admitted to killing Cameron. She claims they planned to run away together, but Cameron changed his mind and she pushed him into a zombies in a fit of pique. John knows that's not what happened but he can't do anything about it. Thank you for finally unburdening yourself. John said, helplessly, that Janice had confessed to the crime, so could she get a lighter sentence? Virginia said that people need to feel safe, and that an example must be made. John was speechless. After Virginia left, Janice said it didn't matter anymore as she had nothing left to lose. Her brother was dead. Cameron was dead. She had nothing, but John still had Naomi. She revealed that they had hidden several barrels of gasoline in Cameron's house's basement, and a motorcycle stashed 39 miles away. She urged John to leave, saying the place was rotten and doomed. John, however, encouraged Janice not to give up, insisting there was still a chance. John spent his evening alone, drinking somberly as he stared at a map in his hands. At this moment, Jacob entered the room, knowing that John was in a bad mood and came specifically to keep him company and chat. Jacob informed John that Virginia was planning to execute Janice the next morning, since both were from Morgan's team. John had always trusted them. He told Jacob that one must persist in doing the right thing, even if it meant death. Especially as a police officer, John was determined, stating that only one person was guarding Janice, and he planned to rescue Janice and leave this place. Naomi's a nurse, surely she won't be implicated. Finally, John handed a letter to Jacob, asking him to ensure that Naomi received it. He believed Naomi would understand why he had to do this. John couldn't bear to watch someone be wrongfully executed. In the middle of the night, John prepared his things and headed straight to the cell. Only to find Janice missing, he had a bad premonition. John followed a singing voice to the forest outside, where a speaker was tied to a tree. Underneath the tree was a chain with only one foot left on it, and then there were four zombies munching away on something. John emotionlessly killed the zombies, wondering if Janice had really been executed. Upon moving the zombies, he found only a half-eaten body, unrecognizable. At that moment, John saw another zombie in the distance, that's right. It was Janice who had turned into a zombie, his last bit of hope shattered. With deep sorrow, John looked at Janice's half-eaten body, realizing his helplessness. Reluctantly, he ended Janice's suffering. The drifting music seemed so jarring now. All John could do was to give Janice a proper burial. Was this community really a warm home? John returned to the neighborhood with his gun in hand. He had a determined look on his face and Jacob called out to him. John says Janice was executed early. Jacob said he knew leading John to suspect Jacob had betrayed him. However, Victor showed up and claimed that Jacob hadn't told anyone, but Victor knew that John would try to rescue, so he told Virginia. Seeing Victor admit this, John could no longer hold back. To prevent John from doing something rash, Victor rushed to fight with him, allowing John to release his pent-up emotions. You killed Janice! Janice was always gonna take the fall. I kept you from going down with her. We could've got away! In theory, Janice's death was inevitable, and Victor's actions were to protect John, morally. However, John couldn't accept it. John was utterly disillusioned with the community. Janice was right. This place would destroy everything. The next day, Virginia announced to the community that Janice was the culprit. She cunningly hailed John as a hero who had uncovered the truth. John's heart felt like it was pierced by a thousand arrows. 
He couldn't do anything, exposing the truth would not only be disbelieved but also endanger Naomi. Virginia also made John a real cavalryman, and apparently she tied John to her ranks. Virginia was a formidable woman, the crowd applauded the supposed hero. Only Dakota she looked at John with disappointment. John was equally disappointed in himself. The next morning, John opened his door to find Naomi, the woman he longed for. Virginia had transferred her here to win over John. John didn't show excitement but looked like a wrong child. Naomi sensed something was off with John but didn't speak of it, perhaps sensing his shame. After traversing half the country in the post-apocalyptic world and enduring countless hardships, Dwight finally found his wife. After a long time, they are naturally very close to each other. But then the walkie-talkie rings, and it's Virginia's man in charge, calling Dwight and Althea on the walkie-talkie. It was mandatory for those out on missions to report back daily. Dwight glanced at the time, realizing they were an hour late for the check-in. He was puzzled, as Althea had supposedly gone back earlier to cover for them, giving the couple some time together. But now it seems that Althea did not go back, with no choice. Dwight responded to the message, apologizing for missing the check-in and explaining they had encountered a horde of zombies that delayed them. The voice on the other end didn't make it difficult for them, merely asking them to investigate and report back in 48 hours. Dwight didn't want to involve his wife, Sherry, in Virginia's team and planned to escape to a place where no one could find them. However, Sherry insisted they couldn't run away, arguing that Virginia would find them and she couldn't just leave like that. Then, Sherry said she would fetch some utensils from the kitchen, Dwight felt something was off, as there was no sound from the kitchen, growing alert, Dwight called for his wife while grabbing his weapon, upon reaching the kitchen, he found it empty, hearing some noise outside, Dwight cautiously approached the door and pulled back the curtain, only to retreat in shock, calling out loudly for his wife, when he turned back, by the time Dwight could see the scene outside again, he was in a strange place, Behind him was a man wearing a mask, yelling for his wife. Dwight was more concerned about Sherry's safety than his own predicament. Receiving no response, he lunged at the masked man. In the scuffle, Dwight managed to free himself and grab the man's gun, demanding to know where his wife was. Desperate and almost hysterical, he couldn't bear the thought of losing Sherry again. Just then, Dwight looked up to see several masked individuals pointing guns at him from above the pool. This overwhelming sense of being surrounded was unmistakable and unpleasant. Soon a masked woman reassures Dwight to take it easy. None other than his wife, Sherry. She apologized for bringing him in such a manner, explaining that without these people, she might have been dead. Sherry signaled to her companions that Dwight was trustworthy. She then explains to Dwight that these are people that Virginia considers unworthy of the community, and that some of them are the same people she wants to kill. Therefore, they wore masks to avoid being recognized by Virginia's cavalry. Sherry explained to Dwight that she hadn't involved him in their plans against Virginia to keep him out of harm's way. They were working to bring Virginia down using their own methods. A man in their group presented Althea's camera, indicating they knew Dwight was working for Virginia. He wanted to extract information about Virginia's whereabouts from Dwight. Looks like Althea is in their hands too. Dwight said just because they work for Virginia doesn't mean they do it willingly. He claimed ignorance about her location. Ozzy, skeptical, threatened Dwight, saying he could turn his friend into a corpse with a single command. He started counting down on the walkie-talkie, unmoved by Dwight's explanations. As Ozzy reached one, a voice stopped him. A muscular man descended, removing his mask. Dwight recognized him as Logan's former oil refinery worker. Dwight had once captured and then spared him, later intercepting them on the road to prevent them from reaching the oil fields saving Raleigh from Logan's fate. Neither expected to meet again. Raleigh, knowing Dwight's group as one that helped strangers in the post-apocalyptic world, vouched for their trustworthiness. With Raleigh's backing, the others relented. They soon learned the location of an armored vehicle. Destroying it would make dealing with Virginia easier. Just then, Althea approached. Dwight was relieved to see that Althea was all right. Althea said that the armored car has a strong anti-explosion function and is designed to resist these kinds of damage. This kind of attack would only slow down its speed. Ozzy, puzzled, asked how she knew so much. Althea revealed the vehicle was hers, suggesting that instead of destroying it, they should steal it to use against Virginia. Meanwhile, Morgan and his dog were scouring for supplies on another road. Just as he was talking to the dog. Are you like you're not a Morgan took a look at the dog's condition, but he was fine. In a world with few humans and even fewer working vehicles, such an accident seemed highly improbable, hinting at something amiss. 
Morgan approached, clutching his axe. Feeling some discomfort from his wound due to the collision, the driver also fell from his seat. Clearly rattled by the impact, Morgan, on guard, asked if the collision was an accident and suggested it was a good time for an apology. The man, sizing up Morgan, inquired about Emil's whereabouts. Surprised, Morgan responded that Virginia knew where he was, subtly probing if the man was affiliated with Virginia. However, the man retorted, asking who Virginia was followed by another man emerging from the vehicle. They clarified they were only interested in Emil's key. Morgan, naturally unwilling to admit the key was with him, warned them against any aggressive moves, but with a two-to-one advantage. The men weren't inclined to reason with Morgan, and a fight was imminent. Morgan's skills proved too much for them, no longer the pacifist he once was. Morgan showed no mercy to those harboring ill intentions towards him. One of the attackers leaped to choke Morgan, who struggled fiercely to break free. Both gasping for air afterward, noticing the key around Morgan's neck, the man lunged again to snatch it. Morgan, with a fierce expression, swung his hand, piercing the man's chest. Morgan realized the key he possessed might unlock something significant. Meanwhile, Dwight and his group prepared an ambush for the armored vehicle at a road junction. Soon they could see the armored car coming from far away. They put on masks so that even if the operation fails, they can't let the people inside see their faces because they all have friends and family. As the armored vehicle passed by the building, they swiftly followed on horseback. Inside the armored vehicle, there was only one cavalryman driving. He was on the verge of completing his mission and preparing to return to report back. Just then he saw in his mirror a man on horseback behind him. In a matter of seconds, the horse had reached the front of the vehicle. The man knocked out his antenna. Althea, familiar with her own vehicle, knew this would disrupt its radio transmission.